The thief take a rise. A pitiable man. No, no. His quarries. They are pitiable. The most pitiable sinners. Woe be unto the lawbreakers, the murderers, scoundrels, swindlers, crooks, and cheaters of the city. For the thief taker is on the hunt. The sir man makes his nightly rounds without fail, keen eyes darting to and fro, never missing. Over there, young lovers cavorting, at this forsaken hour, a stern rap of his cane is enough to send the starry eyed pups scampering back to their respective domiciles. Above, a mere tabby, out for prey, much like himself, bemuse he, by the bridge. A sight that boils a taker's blood. Watchman Weathersby has abandoned his post. The third night. Soon the wretch will taste the lash for his transgression. And he had such promise in the beginning. But the poor wretch can scarcely be blamed. Watchmen aren't exactly a voluntary position. It is not as if these bedraggled makeshift marshers were trained in any of this. But the law is a law and Grimsby is Grimsby. Without the likes of the eager thief taker and the conscripted watchman. This city would be put to the torch long ago. Without pleasure, he marked a dereliction in his law book. Without thinking, he dodged an errant snowball. He taps the cane once more and the snowy youths scurried back to their houses. Ah, snow, the portent for the Feast of Michaelmas. While others of Cecil were expensive presents at scrunchious feasts, this just man is merely content to reunite friends and family and sing tales by the fire. An occasional nip of the nog, of course. It has been a cursed age since the taker took on this duty, far from the humble town of Yardsley, over the mountains and far, far from the sea. But Grimsby was in need for a taker, and Yardsley is not. It has a need for a taker since Morgo the Ruthless has life thrashed out of him by the very same man not dutifully patrolling the Arben's piers. The exchange, tragically, was not one-sided. Morgo is the reason he walks with a cane now. But yet, he walks, unlike Morgo, unlike the Duttons, unlike the Malachian assassin. Many who thought they can take the life of the Taker, yet ended up forfeiting their own. The Taker takes a brief respite. There, across the black abyss, the mountains of Aronia. He continues his patrol, keen eyes lingering in the direction of his home country, yet never failing to dart. The piers, the waters, Aronia. The taverns. With a brisk step, he approaches an old timer. Perchance he is too inebriated. Nay, a mere stumble. The gentlemen tip their hats and part ways. Tavern, piers, waters, gold corner, Aronia. Fair Aronia. It has been two long years since he has left luscious green Yardsley for the stone monoliths and sea breeze of Grimsby. How he longs to go home, if only for Michaelmas. One and a half week, thought he, and he'll be home. To friends, to family, to tales, to Nog, to the Eliza, and to brave Canaan. To a blood-curdling wail, evil is afoot. With haste, he appears at the door of the stately will grew estate. Poor master, madame. Their young girl lies in mortal peril and may not even survive Michaelmas. And now, their valuable possessions have been absconded, including a lovely doll for the illnesses from the faraway lands. His face still a stone, yet his soul a hurricane. He sternly listens to the poor couple spill their heartbreak. Sound asleep, a tremendous crash as a priceless stained glass window lies shattered into a thousand pieces. With force and brutality, the burglar, nay, barbarian, ransacks the house for valuables. Before the master can confront this depravity with musket in hand, the vandals disappear from the premises. Oh, but for the faraway doll to remain, the Wilgroves would give her half their possessions. Now, this Michaelmas, a little girl's lass, she may not even have a gift. The temptation to rend this abomination from stem to stern is overwhelming. The law is a law, and the abominable thing must be properly tried and sentenced to just retribution. The taker examines the depraved scene, shattered glass, each pain worth thousands, its historical value incalculable. Furniture dating before Greensby, broken into splinters, silverware, candles, paintings vanish into the maw of some monster. And of course, the doll from far away, Sandy Amelia, cleverly hidden in a false compartment. Premeditation, 
some of the knowledge of the real Gru estate. Mayhap said this gruntle worker or partner. If the crimes committed in such a rash fashion, if the demon was more careful, it would have absconded with more. Then wealth is not the goal, but devastation. The Wilgroos are exhausted, and the young missus limped out of her room to see what is happening. Enough. The taker must allow the Wilgroos to return to slumber, fitful and unpleasant as it may be, for they need it. The taker tips his hat and departs. At the front courtyard, the taker shook his head ruefully as he peered around his surroundings. Fresh snow has already obliterated any tracks the animal may have left behind. With three sharp whistle blasts, three watchmen were summoned. The taker merely had to point and the watchmen obeyed. The poor shivering guardians, the fair taker would be sure to give them extra portions for break and coins for their labor. Not too far from the gold corner is where old Lem temporarily calls home. Lem is an institution of these hilly, snowy, wooded seaside lands, a harmless old man who not so much does not have a home, but does not desire one. Legend states that he was born of the deepest, darkest Carabanoch woods, already with a walking stick in hand with birds chirping by his side. Silly stories, entertaining but absurd. What was not absurd is the fact that no one dare mishandle Lem, not even the wild Malachians. Even the old butcher and his crone that used to oppress that benighted land took joy in the traveling vagabond. Though Lem does not take the same joy, for Lem may not have nor desire much but wisdom. That he has in spades. And wisdom tells him to avoid the Malachian royal city as much as possible and to always abscond when the Praetorians come seeking him. Even? No, not even. Especially. Especially with an invitation to the royal gala. Thus, it is heartbreaking to see his wisdom availed him not. Unconscious and bruised, his tin cup of generously donated food spilled out onto the cold streets. The doctor, not one for late night surprises, dutifully obliged as he and the taker cradled Lem into his patient's cot. The same love for a stew he gave the poor wanderer before, now cold on the dirty snow strewn streets, he gladly replaced in a nice clean bowl. Yet Lem is not eating. Lem is murmuring. Frightful things, terrifying things. Nothing that will the taker as to which fiend inflicted this atrocity. <laughs> A rap on the thick wooden door. Withdrawing from his ministrations of old Lem, the doctor grumbled towards it, aggrieved at the presence of another nocturnal visitor. The door opens, and the young minister, blanketed in snow, alarm in his eyes, barked politely as to where the taker can be found. The taker was already behind the good doctor. Inquiries were made. Were any injured? Nay. Thank the most holy for small favors. Where was the transgression? The lady of comfort aunt's house in chapel. A place of the maker, vile scum, the nature of the sin, death most foul. For it was not the gleaming gold reliquary, nor the priceless sacred text the brigand or brigands were after. It was the alms, and not only that, the maniac committed a deed most heinous. Desecrating months of food stores and donated clothes for the long cold winter ahead, beautiful dresses, handsome tunics, rent asunder. Fresh bread, hot soups, and cured and preserved meats carelessly strewn about on the stone floor. It is insufficient that this demon purloined the coins meant for the poor. What could be so base as to destroy the noble work of shadowable giving? Theory is one matter, but vandalizing perfectly good clothes and despoiling food for those who have few? It was a fitful sleep. It was sufficient. The taker awoken, threw his coat and cap on, and briskly made his way to the captain of the guard. 
The captain, caught off guard, but none too perplexed by the taker's early arrival, nodded as the taker greeted him tersely. In no time, the good captain briefed the taker as to the progress in bringing to justice the evil doers of the previous night. The Wilgru Manor had no further incidents. Unfortunately, it yielded no further evidence either. Old Lem was not able to eye his assailant for the coward attacked from behind. Finally, no further leads besides what the taker has uncovered last night can be gleaned from the chapel almshouse. Morose, the taker seated himself next to the captain. The captain recommended that the taker return home to rest some more. It is still five hours until the taker is officially on duty and the captain and his guards withdrew into the keep. But the taker cannot rest. Such grievous outrage he has not witnessed since Morgo. Nay. Worse than even that soulless, black-hearted fiend. To get the devil his due, at least Morgo was generous to old Lem. Guard Webley appeared. He saluted his captain and addressed the master thief taker. The fisherman had netted quite a prize, and is assured that both the master taker and Sir Captain would be very interested in their catch of the day. Gold candelabras, silverware, antique muskets and swords, once shining now covered in mud and seaweed. Alas, that was not the extent of the damage. With Malachian intent, this creature proceeds to bend, break, and scratch, perhaps irreparably, these invaluable treasures. And there, floating in a bay, unnoticed by Sir Captain, the diligent guard, nor the multitude of fishermen, is a face. The taker's keen eyes and swift hands immediately rescue the ivory face from the sea foam. Few have ever seen this lovely face carved artfully into ivory. The ivory face would have been attached to a baobab -ba body clothed in a lovely beaded skirt or a fanciful headdress. Altogether, they would be combined to make an exquisite tiny doll, the prized possession of the young ladies or those ladies young at heart who primarily reside in the faraway lands, in Emilia. There is no longer any need for the list of malcontents against the Wilgrews, nor is there any need to hassle the hobos and homeless of Grimsby for clues as to Lem's assailant. Neither is there need for entering the chapel and its layman. This barbarity, this senseless vandalism, senseless, were it to be so. Premeditated. Premeditated to ruin a family's last chance for Michaelmas together. Premeditated to bring pain to a jolly old rambler who has brought joy to even the hardest of hearts. Premeditated to undo the labor and generosity of so many to help those less fortunate. Premeditated to inflict misery. There is a method to the madness. There is sense in the senseless. At long last, the motivation, as wicked and capricious as it is, is made clear. There is a thief of it. It cares not for possessions. No. It is after something infinitely more valuable. This vicious monster is a thief of all joy, and the thief taker knew precisely where the thief will strike next. adequately locked, for the possessions beyond matter not to most people, especially for those of a heart. Stuffed animals, dolls, tin soldiers, balls, board games, and cards of all types, all the gifts from Grimsby to the orphans of Grimsby. Not the thief had his way. The foul being jammed the metal rod into the worn padlock, and with one twist the obstacle is no more. The sound of breaking lock summoned the taker. Of course, the next target of the Thief of All Joy would be to those who need it most. Startled, the Thief spun around to eye his nemesis, but the Taker has already apprented his quarry. There's no use in struggling. A sharp whistle blast, insurance against the Thief's accomplices. Though, who else would be so heartless and cruel as to join in this degeneracy? Whether it's be limps forth, still smarting from his sentence. One long blast. Within minutes, Sir Captain and two guards appear. A handle. Nay, this grievous crime must be investigated and handled personally. With the captain's blessing, the taker and the thief marched through the frigid night towards the cells. No pressure from the taker was needed. The confession came spilling out, fruitful, yet infuriating. 
painstakingly watching all the Wilgus as they came back from far away, as they cautiously hid the Michaelmas joy from their only shout, observing the comings and goings of the ministers and worshippers, to see any holes in their vigilance and caution, to see where the donated goods would be stored, to see when the chapel cooks are done with their meals for the destitute, waiting for old Len to make his rounds to Grimsby. Maximizing the Suffering the public bade for sanction as the martial magistrate promptly delivers the sentence. The beast is led up to the gallows. No emotion clouds his face. The good painter asks for his final statement. It has been a week since the man was hung by the neck until his last breath and his final heartbeat. The snow is getting heavier as the taker continues his vigilance. He looks up and shakes his head. What a ghastly sight it is to see the Wilgrew Manor all draped in black, so close to Michaelmas. The sun is nearly gone now. Gold Corner, Pierce, Trade House, Old Lem. No, not him. He was already sojourned elsewhere, as is his custom. Left west. Hampshire. Brecoot. Aronia. All the man's that vagrant better make himself useful the next time he steps foot into Grimsby. At the part, the young lovers were courting again. While they still had an hour left, one knows that these lazy, selfish youths would never make it home on time. Thus the cane rat was necessary to send the puzzle of birds back to their correct nest. Sun is gone now. The taker approaches the bridge. Where is Washman Castor? Oh, merely indisposed to nature's call. The eager juvenile salutes his master and his master nods tersely. All sight comes the log book. Not being at his post, a severe dereliction. The lash it is. Yes, it is his first day, but we're allowed to go uncorrected. How will he learn? The keen eyes spotted the snowball, but the body was unable. The chili powder dissipated harmlessly on the taker's hat and cloak. Before the adolescents had time to make amends, the taker fell upon the culprit as a cannonball trunching in hand. The fender lies on the street, motionless. The other tiny scoff flaws have now vacated. The taker surveys his prey. Not much older than Keenan. The unconscious lad was drugged to the cell, purely out of duty now. As the lock fell in place and a young lad stirred painfully on straw floor, the taker felt a miss. Back on patrol, there was not on the street. The taverns closed early. The third night in a row, so close to Michaelmas. The shots once for a life and I shuddered until daybreak. But it not open for a few hours more. The taker wanted to take pride in the quiet streets, the lack of reckless carousing, the absence of drunken fights. Just him and his watchman, who will soon be punished for various transgressions. He cannot. Lost in thought, he almost ran into it. The gallows, where the thief of all joy met his justice. Then he remembered the last words of the infernal spawn. No, less that. A mere man. The final words of that man's life before the news to all of Grimsby, to the painter, to the taker himself. Thank you. It crept on him from his spine to his forehead. The hairs on his corpus stood like tombstones. The spider of guilt and shame enveloped him. Realization struck with a hammer blow soon after. He faces the waters of the Arbenz.
the lovebirds, Watchman Caster, and now this young boy, out cold in the cell for the high treason of an errant snowball. The rippling black mirror reflects his horrified visage. For a thief taker has become just a thief.